grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our Advent Herald is, of course, John the Baptist, who, well, he kind of sticks out like the rose candle on the Advent wreath. Our Lord's word to him is, Blessed is whoever is not trapped in connection with me. This is a good word for John. It's a good word for us as well. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Two weeks ago, our focus was upon Jesus' first advent in humility. When he was born in a lowly manger, eventually to ride into Jerusalem on a lowly donkey to face the humiliation of the cross and death itself. Last week, our focus was upon Jesus' second advent, the one in which he comes in glory, making our winter an eternal summer. And it is the advent that we anticipate, and of course this is the advent which is to come. Then we have this time in between, in between Jesus' first advent and then of course his second, where we live right now, waiting and watching, sometimes in confusion, sometimes in doubt. This is where, though, our gospel lesson comes in for us. John's entire life was set up to herald the advent of Christ. If you were with us this past uh, midweek where we had our dinner together and then we came in for Vespers, this was the focus of Zechariah, his father, who took John and said, this is what you're going to be, this is what you're going to do. And of course, it's exactly what happened. He began his ministry on the banks of the Jordan River. He did exactly what his father and what the prophet Isaiah said that he would do, and that he would lift up every valley and level every mountain. Lifting up the valleys included, re included proclaiming repentance to the penitent. Come and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then comforting them with the good news that the Christ has come where he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Leveling the mountains is what John preached to the impenitent to the tax collectors, to the Roman soldiers, of course the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He says what? He says to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, repent for the Christ is coming for you as well. Remember when John the Baptist preached, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Folks, that's leveling the mountains. John was relentless. He never deviated from preaching Christ and his gospel, along with Christ and his judgment, law and gospel, as we would say it in Lutheran circles. And even in the face of authority, which of course, as you know, is what landed him in prison. As John sat there, not knowing what lie around the corner for him, it seems that he had this nagging, lingering question. If Jesus is the Christ, and John knows that he is, why hasn't the wheat been gathered into the barn and the chaff not been burnt up the way that it should be with unquenchable fire? You see, because as Jesus carried on his work, it, it seemed to be nothing but grace. It was nothing but the lifting up of the valleys without a single act of judgment taking place. In other words, John believed, John preached, and John expected. John did everything that God sent him to do. He lived his life alone in the desert, refusing most comforts of life. He preached God's word boldly and purely and tirelessly. And one by one, he sent his own disciples away to follow Jesus instead of himself. John did everything he was supposed to do. But the Christ? Not so much. 
The Lamb of God was to make all things right by destroying wickedness. And saving His people from suffering at the hands of sinners just like John. The problem is, is that the Romans were still running the nation. The Pharisees were still running the city. The Sadducees were still running the temple. And it sounds as if Jesus has gone soft. What gives? What gives with this? John trusted, but he didn't understand. And folks, if that at times is not every single one of us, us in this place this morning, I don't know what is. You trust, you believe, but you don't understand. You trust, but there are times more so than you might want to admit where you don't understand. And why is that? Well, I can't be definitive here, but I think it's safe to say that you want a God who makes things right and does so right now, without delay. I don't know about you, but that's me. I want a God who makes things right, right now. Moreover, one might say, nothing seems to be improving in my life in spite of being a Christian. I see my sinful flesh just as wicked and active as ever. I feel the struggle between faith and unbelief taking place in my own heart. I see the world winning battle after battle against Christians and the Christian life becoming less and less comfortable as the days go by. Christians suffer and die right alongside the wicked and the devil. The devil seems to be laughing all the way to the bank. Rejoice in the Lord always, as this day in Advent tells us to do. Who can do that when things are not as they should be? Folks, that line of thinking, that can lead us to anger and cynicism. It can lead even further into fear, and even worse into despair. And ultimately, we can lose the faith altogether. Just with that type of meditation, so to speak, going on in our heads. It's from this darkness and this confusion and doubt that John asks his question of Jesus. Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Upon hearing this, by way of John's disciples, Jesus could have used a word of law to like crush John's potential unbelief. But instead, the Lord answers John in a way that will comfort him. What did Isaiah say? Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort, comfort ye my people. It's exactly what Jesus does for John. He points John back to the Scriptures to places in the book of Isaiah, which John clearly knew. Tell John this, he says to the disciples who are going to report back to John. Tell John this. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Folks, this was to remind John that what the Scriptures say the Messiah will do, Jesus is doing it to the letter. He's not deviating from His script. But didn't the same prophets promise fire and brimstone for the wicked? Of course they did! Permit me to say that it seems that even John, John the Baptist, didn't fully grasp that the coming of the Christ is twofold. One where He comes in humility and the other where He comes in glory. John is ready for Christ to ignite the refiner's fire upon wickedness, upon sinners, to lather up that launderer's soap on them of which the prophet Malachi foretold. 
And though that will ultimately be fulfilled by Jesus, not yet. Not now. Because he still has compassion on the wicked, giving them time to repent, to believe, and to be saved, even as his patience with this world has led each one of you and me to repentance and salvation. So what our Lord tells John is crucial. Again, I say for John and for us. He says, blessed is he who is not offended. Blessed is the one who is not tripped up because of me and my ways. That means Jesus will not do what you expect him to do at times. Can I get a witness? Jesus will not do what you and I expect him to do at times. I mean, look and think about this. Can someone stumble, maybe even give up on the faith because they're not satisfied with Jesus' plan for the world, that that plan includes suffering and pain and loss? Can they abandon the faith because of that? Absolutely. But blessed are they who don't stumble over that. Can one give up on Jesus because they're not content with the humble working of Jesus through the ministry of word and sacrament? Absolutely, they can and they do. But blessed are they who don't give up on Jesus. Beloved, you will not understand all the plans that God has for this world. Or for your life, for that matter. It's above you. I mean, you don't know the day of His return, and you won't escape the reality of the world's sin, suffering, and death until you die. But don't stumble over these things. Don't be offended because of Jesus' ways or because the cross that He has you bear is heavy. I guarantee you He is carrying the heavier end. Don't be offended in Jesus because He's not making everything right, right now, immediately. He will. He will. But in the meantime, between this advent of humility and this advent of glory, in the meantime, know that right now, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ remains hidden, where he comes to earth and to the hearts of mankind with words, not with fire, but with humble words of preaching and teaching, words that are connected to outward signs, outward sign of water and bread and wine. That's how he comes to us. And that's glorious. See, the launderer's soap that you get now, it's his abrasive law, exposing and condemning your sin. And this is followed by the cleansing power of the gospel as it drives you to Jesus and pronounces forgiveness over you. For now, take comfort that you hear God speak to you through his word and your pastors, that he gives you his body and blood for the nourishment of your soul as you make your way out of Egypt into the promised land. Take comfort in the fact that He loves you, that He will not hurt you or abandon you. Take comfort in the fact that He hears your prayers and He sees your tears. Take comfort in the fact that He has promised to hold you up as His dear child even in your darkest hour. Jesus sent the light of God's Word into the darkness of John's prison cell, which sustained John's faith all the way until his head was placed upon a block and the executioner took his swing and he didn't miss. He's a professional. Was John present for Holy Week? Nope. What about for the institution of the Lord's Supper? No. He wasn't there to see the Son of God die upon the cross and He wasn't there to hear the joyful good news that Christ Jesus has risen from the dead. However, 
you know those things to be true. You've heard these truths from the testimony of the apostles passed down to you through the ages, and that is enough to sustain you and keep you in the one true faith all the days of your life. So if you happen to be the one who is sitting in darkness and confusion right now, beloved, know that a bruised reed he will not break, the smoldering wick Jesus will not snuff out, to the brokenhearted, Jesus speaks his word of peace unto you. And to those who are barely burning, he said, blessed are those who are not trapped in connection with me. Trust me. Trust my words. Trust my promises. Trust my ways. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.